Hi, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Collecting and saving seeds can be a fun and rewarding experience for the home gardener. So today, we're going to help you get started. And if you've always wanted to grow your own vegetables, stay tuned because today we're starting a vegetable garden here at the studio so we can garden along with you. All that and more is just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Ms. Susie Askew. Ms. Susie is the Plant Activities Coordinator at Lichterman Nature Center, and Mr. D is here today. Thanks for being here. Nice to be here. Oh, yes, yes. We're going to have a good time. Okay, collecting and saving seeds. All right, so here's the first question. Is this the time of the year to do that? It is a good time of year because things are um, becoming dry and they're they're becoming viable. Okay. Um, up until now, a lot of things were not, um, you could collect them, but they weren't through their whole growth period okay. and they wouldn't germinate. So now if they're dry, they're probably ready to collect and store. And I'm pretty sure a lot of them have been dry. Yes. <laughs> with this weather we've had. We just hope they got pollinated. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with one of the harder ones to do, which okay. is a fleshy um, seed that's covered in, um, it's actually a fruit. Uh, or a berry, and these are um, a native plant called beauty berry yeah. that I think is just a spectacular fall blooming, I mean fall seeded plant that you forget about it till fall and then you think, oh I wish I had one of those in my garden. So we try to remind people at our plant sale that you have to plant in the spring to have fall okay. color and this is a great one to have. It's also a great wildlife food. Okay. But the berry is uh, a tiny white seed within here that is flesh colored. I mean, um, it's covered in flesh. So what you want to do is clean it and then store it like Mother Nature would over winter in cold. Okay. And that's called cold stratification. All right. So all these things need cold stratification. This is another plant that we offer at our plant sale that's become quite popular. It's native to Texas and, and uh, warmer region, but it now winters over here. It comes back in May, so it's a hard plant to sell at our plant sale in April because they don't see much plant to it. Okay. It pops out really um, vigorously in May, and by this time of year, it's covered in these red blossoms that are called Turk's Cap. Turk's Cap, it's, yeah, those are, yeah, those are pretty. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's Malva viscus arboris, and the fruit looks like a tiny little apple. I'm going to remove this so you can actually see the fruit. And uh, the book say that you can make jam and jelly out of this, but we save all the fruits for the seeds. Okay. So they're also flesh colored. And what we do is we clean them. Um, and you end up with four or five seed capsules covered in flesh. And then you clean them again. And sometimes we even use kitchen utensils like a sieve <laughs> and rub them on the sieve. And um, then you have to let them dry really well and store them. And we store in these um, kind of envelopes. If they're really dry, we can store them in a tube or the easiest thing is a medicine mm -hmm, bottle. Mm -hmm. But the storage requires coal, so we put them in the refrigerator to keep them um, coal stratified. Okay. Now, where do you get something like this from, though, the store? Uh, we yeah. order those online. They're mm -hmm. a, um, a typically used for seed storage or stamp collecting. Okay. We also have bought at uh, office supply stores coin envelopes. Mm -hmm. We also use um, the ma mailers you get in junk mail that okay. for return. We save all those and store in those. This is a wonderful storage container that we have a lot of because one of our volunteers feeds her dogs out of this brand of dog food. 
So uh, anything works as long as the seeds are dry. And you say store in a refri refrigerator, not a freezer. Uh, right. Either one usually works, but we have more room in our refrigerator. Okay. So we we have it just for seeds. Okay. Uh, right now you can go out and find dogwood uh, seeds, and they too are covered in a fleshy pulp, so they can be cleaned and stored. And then we pull them out in the winter and seed them on a flat and like, make them think it's spring, and sometimes mm. they germinate. It's a risk, but it's worth taking because you end up getting plants. Um, magnolia is an interesting yeah. seed. Uh, my husband calls these hand grenades. <laughs> <laughs> I think he okay. threw them as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> but um, inside this big um, seed carrier, you see the fleshy yeah. seed. And we would do the same thing with this. We would uh, clean it and we would pull out the seed that's in it and then we would let it dry and mm -hmm. then we'd store it. Uh, the other thing that's important with seed storage is labeling. Okay. You want to, once you get started on this, you're going to end up with lots of seeds. So be sure and put the name on it. We go by botanical name, okay. so we try to be exact. The date and where you found it. Okay. And that way you can go back to your source if, if you need to. Okay. Let me ask you this. So how do you go about cleaning that though? Well, this one I just manipulated it out till the actual <laughs> seed came out of it. So there's the fleshy part and there's the seed. Again, let it dry and then store it once it's dry. Hmm, um, this came out pretty easy. Yesterday at um, a meeting, a woman in Suburban Garden Club asked me if I'd ever heard of stomp tomatoes. <laughs> she brought some by today. I love this because we have Stomp in the Swamp at Lichterman uh -huh. where we um, raise money for the um, center. So this is a stomp tomato. She says, in October, you stomp it in the ground yeah. where you want it to grow. <laughs> and then uh, in the spring, it germinates and you have a little uh, cherry tomatoes. I thought that was clever. And Mr. D, what's another name for that that you mentioned earlier? Uh, in the cattle business, we call it trampling in. <laughs> we trample in fescue seed. And, and trample in. I like trampling that. Trampling in. Okay. Do you have any other seed pot um, methods? This is another look? one that's a little tricky, okay. but it's a fabulous plant. In fact, we yeah. told everybody last year they had to have this in their, in their garden. Just one. Uh, it's a buckeye, uh -huh. Aeschylus pavia. And uh, you try to capture the seeds immediately when they hit the ground or before once the seed pot opens and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, the secret is knowing which piece of it to put oh. on the soil and if you look carefully at it you can see that there's this dark oval right here and that's what needs to touch the soil. And um, we have really good germination rates for this and this one we directly sow on top of the soil. You don't bury it. It sits there. We cover it with a screen so that animals won't get in it and disturb it. And then we put it outside and let Mother Nature germinate it. And she does a great job. Wow. So in the, in the uh, late winter, early spring, we see it send up a leaf and a root. And then we transfer it out to individual pots. So a pretty good germination rate. Excellent. Okay. Now, isn't that a good luck charm? <laughs> uh, I think somebody carries it at this table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good luck charm. <laughs> it's a good luck charm for attracting... Oh, um, hummingbirds and butterflies too, especially in the spring. We tell everyone that it signals the hummingbirds mm. to stop in Memphis. Okay. So it blooms first and early and it's a brilliant red in the forest. And it's a good um, site location too. It will. We have some in direct sun, we have some in deep forest. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's adaptable. Now what else is it that you want to show us? We only have a couple of minutes okay. left. Okay. Um, easy things. Okay. Um, easy. Yeah, like this is just obvious. It's ready to harvest. It's dry and the secret is to pull these off and separate them and store them or directly sow them. Uh, something like this, this has already been taken through the process of pulling off the uh, stem. It looks like a thimble. It's called thimble plant and it's an anemone. But once you uh, separate it, it's almost like wool. Yeah. And the seeds are so tiny, we, we don't separate them anymore. We just plant this. This has wonderful foliage. In fact, it's grown more for its foliage. Now, how do you plant that then? We just uh, top, uh, plant it on the top of the soil. We don't bury it. Okay. And okay. it germinates. Okay. These are annuals that come back. Um, they start in my garden in early spring and they bloom and then they go to seed. In another week, these will be seeds. They self-sow, they drop to the ground. I pull out all the old ones and this is my second crop this year. This mm. is Cosmos. And it's, it's not a native, but uh, it is a, a great hummingbird butterfly food. 
Pretty. It's UT Orange. Mr. UT Bean. Orange. Yeah. You get in your landscape. It's also yeah. Virginia Orange <laughs> and Auburn Orange. Oh, okay. all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's another one that's a seed that you can tell is ready to harvest and you can sell you can sow this on the ground. And I've got to talk about yes, Allium stembergii. Yes. This is a great example of a carrier. You think this whole thing might be the seed, but it's actually the uh, carrier for it. The seeds are within these little tiny um, pods and they're little tiny black seeds like pepper. And they will dispense the seed. This is a bulb that's ornamental. It's uh, a fantastic plant to grow. You get the bulb this time of year, order it, prob probably. I don't think, I don't know if anybody that carries it. You have to order it, plant it, and in the spring it puts on this fantastic show. What I don't know, this is my first year to grow it, okay. is if it's true to seed. I have a feeling it is not. I have a feeling I have to get more bulbs if I want more plants. That's a lot of seeds in there too, it looks like. It is. So I'll be trial, trial and error on this one and seeing if I can get another Allium stembergii. Okay. Ah, oh, that looks good though. Mm -hmm. Kind of unique, different. Yeah, it looks like a, an atom or, <laughs> or a science fair yeah, project or something. That's very And then let's unique. do the last one. Okay. This is a plant I'm really excited about. We'll do the last about. one quickly. Okay. okay. This is a, a blue lobelia and it's, it's just a brilliant blue. This is uh, in flower and this is in seed. And when this is totally dry, I will cut it and clean it and the seeds are extremely tiny. So you have to gather them carefully on a piece of paper and put them in an envelope. And um, they're so tiny that you get maybe a, um, a teaspoonful from three or four plants. That's but, pretty small. But you can see what a great plant it is. All right, thanks Miss Susan. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that good information. Tell you passionate about it too. <laughs> right now we're gonna take a look at some gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. When we get back, Mr. D and I will be outside to get our garden started. All right, Mr. D, let's talk a little bit about site selection for our garden. Well, probably one of the most important things is full sun. I don't know of any vegetables that do well in shade. Yeah. One also needs to keep in mind that a tree roots, on the average, grow out about one and a half times the height of the tree. Okay. So just because you have a tree <laughs> 20 or 30 yards away doesn't right. mean the roots aren't there, right. you know, causing you a problem. Garden needs to be in a well-drained site. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Most vegetables don't like wet feet. However, with raised beds, you can put your garden in a low, lower-lying yeah. area if you have the beds raised, because right. that will that will handle that internal drainage. Is there anything else that you can think of we need to consider? Uh, as far as soil cycle? test, soil <laughs> test. <laughs> you know, in a garden spot, a soil test. Raised beds, you need to be mm -hmm. sure you check the media that you put in there mm -hmm. and make sure that your pH is right. Most vegetables. Uh, grow best in a slightly acidic uh, soil around mm -hmm. six, 6 6.5 uh, you know okay. is, is what's ideal for for most vegetables now what about how about this one do you want your vegetable garden way away from the house when you go out and you harvest you want it to be close uh, closer the better <laughs> you'd like to be able to look <laughs> out the, the window right. and be able to run out there and chase the critters uh -huh. out that, that uh -huh. are getting in it um, but the closer the better you know you need it to be handy and and uh, if, if it is handy you'll spend a lot more time out there sure sure and speaking of handy, now what about our water source? You definitely want your water source to be pretty close to your yeah, garden thing. selection area. That's another yeah. another good idea. Hoses aren't cheap, <laughs> and the closer you can have a, a water source to your mm -hmm. garden, because you probably are going to need to water. And and also for other things that you do, if you use uh, pesticides, mm -hmm. it's nice to have a water source handy, to, so you can do your mixing area, sure. you know, out there pretty close to your. Sure. To, to where you grow your vegetables. Okay, because during these hot summers, you know what? The, that hose will get hot. <laughs> You're not going to want to pull it way out mm. to that area in the back. And it'll kink <laughs> on you. All right, let's get started. Okay. We've chosen a site that has a very, very healthy stand of Bermuda grass. <laughs> it does. <laughs> and uh, Bermuda grass has the uh, ability to grow up through media mm -hmm. that you put on top mm -hmm. of it. 
So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna try to kill the grass and we're gonna do a little research trial here. Okay. We're gonna use three <laughs> different methods. Right. Uh, and they're gonna really get to see us at work, yeah. And that's right, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna cover this with a tarp, okay. this spot right here. And the second plot here, we're going to cover it with clear plastic. And this larger spot back here, we're going to use glyphosate or Roundup. Roundup. Uh, and uh, Roundup is cleared for use to burn down mm -hmm. uh, for vegetables. And the reason is it has absolutely no soil activity. That's right. Uh, glyphosate is taken up by the green tissue and the leaves of, of growing plants and it systemically goes throughout the plant and kill the plant. But right. it has absolutely no soil activity and that's why it is labeled for use uh, to burn down for vegetable gardens. Okay. So you wanna go ahead and get started? Let's, let's go ahead and, and get this one right okay, here. Let's on start side. with the tarp. I think this will, this will work. We're going to need to uh, keep in mind the wind could very easily blow this off, yeah. so we've got some rocks here to weight it down with. Uh, weight the corners. Okay. It'll take uh, it'll take some time, but this is uh, is going to block photosynthesis. Uh, if we were doing this during the hot hottest part of the summer, when the temperature is up around 100 degrees then uh, solarization would occur. Mm -hmm. And that would actually kill some of the weed seeds and some of the soil fungi and right. insects and things like that. But it's a little cooler now. So basically what we're trying to do here is simply block photosynthesis and that by itself will kill the Bermuda grass. Right. Next, let's try the clear plastic right. and see, see how it compares. Mm -hmm. I would uh, expect it not to work quite as fast as the tarp because by being clear, sunlight's still going to get through here. And, right. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens here. Be perfect. Okay. They're going to witch you. All right. Okay. I think I got it pretty good. Yeah. Okay, let's let's weigh her, weight her down a little bit, and okay. you can use anything to uh, to weight it down. This this rebar is going to work well. It takes care of the whole side there. Okay. There we are. Get this end here. Okay, now we've got our uh, two plots covered with plastic. All right. Let's Looks good. let's do the herbicide thing. All right, let's get to it. That's a whole lot easier with a little bit of help. Uh -huh. Okay, we've got uh, okay. three good? gallons, three gallons of mixture here. We've got probably more than we need, uh, but uh, we've got a five percent solution of uh, glyphosate mixed up here, and you don't have to spray it to the point of runoff. We just want to get it get it wet, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. See what kind of pattern I've got. I can almost make two passes down here and do the trick. And this is, we're gonna do it like we would do it in a farmer's field. <laughs> See the way my nozzle is positioned, I'm just gonna walk right down here like this. Okay, cut that off. And I think I'm gonna, rather than back up, I'm gonna walk the same direction. And now we're done, very, very fast. <laughs> All right, Mr. D, how long do you think this is going to take before we see any results? Probably a week to 10 days okay. before we see anything with both the covers and the, the herbicide treatment area. Uh, from a distance, you'll be able to see the, uh, the herbicide area. Uh, it'll start to yellow up yeah. and begin to go down a little bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe two weeks even okay. before uh, we see any real good results. Yeah, I think you nailed the herbicide pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think we'll so. See that. Okay, well, I guess we'll uh, come back in another week or so and see what we have. So let's okay. go back inside for Q&A. Yeah, I'm ready for air conditioning. <laughs>
This yes. is fine. <laughs> All right, here's our first question. It says, we have a letter from Mike and Alice over in Clinton, Tennessee. They must be watching on the Tennessee channel. So welcome to all of our viewers from across Tennessee. And thank you, all right? Here's the question. Eliminator kills fleas and ticks in the yard, but will it kill night crawlers and earthworms? It doesn't tell you on the package. The active ingredient is permethrin, okay, which is 0.50%. If this product kills the worms, what can we use that won't kill the worms, but will kill the ticks, the ants, and the fleas? And Mr. D, you and I have kind of gone back and forth. We've talked about it. And we're thinking this is going to be pretty safe. It is. Uh, I've not seen uh, permethrin as being a, pro uh, a problem as far okay. as killing earthworms. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I found a study. A qu uh, you know, it's been looked at pretty hard. <laughs> and this is a very detailed study that has been uh, that was conducted uh, uh, looking at invertebrates, soil invertebrates, including earthworms, and uh, looking at their permethrin, it was specifically looking at permethrin, and the permethrin levels in these insects and how it affected the birds that mm -hmm. ate them. So, you know, looking at biomagnification yeah. and all that, and, and uh, from what I can see, the earthworms can eat, actually build mm -hmm. up pretty high levels of permethrin and not kill them. So uh, it's not a problem. I don't think it's a problem for earthworms, and if you want to go ahead and use that product to control ticks and fleas, I would do that. Mm -hmm. The only problem I saw with this is uh, it's a problem with cats. Right. Uh, okay. It's not a problem to use this product on dogs, but uh, they have seen some problems with permethrin on cats, so you need to talk with your veterinarian uh, and make sure that it's safe to use on cats if you have cats. Right, and also what I've read too in research, you want to keep this away from aquatic. Aquatic, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a pond or anything like that, don't let it, because it can damage fish mm -hmm. and, and uh, aquatic organisms. Okay. So, Mr. Mike and Alice, there you go. You can use the product. But I did like the fact that they looked at the label. Yes. That's right. We follow always tell people, mm -hmm. follow, read the label. Okay? Yes. All right, there you have it. Here's our second viewer email. It says, Mr. Al writes, my roses have been infected with what looks like rose rosette disease. Is there any treatment short of digging them all up? Get this. I have 40 or so rose bushes. Oh, Mr. Al, I hate to give you this news, but if those roses have the elongated new shoots, have the deformed, stunted leaves, and have numerous pink and red thorns, could be out. rose rosette. Yeah. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. No. That we know of. There's nothing, no treatment. Uh, the, uh, the organism is spread by uh, a leafhopper. Okay. And, uh, so if you see those symptoms on the plant, even a very small number of those symptoms, the plant is infected. Yes. And uh, so basically all you can do is take them out and try to find a, a variety that has some resistance. Right, resistant variety. You know, sure. Go on and take them out and, and destroy them. And, and if you only have one or two plants in your, that's infected, get it out as soon as possible. Right. To keep because a leaf hopper can feed on the infected plant and feed on a, a non-infected plant and give it the disease. Wow, yeah, 40 or so rose bushes. How many are infected? We well, say they have 40 or so, so maybe 40. Maybe 40. That's maybe 40. Not good news. Yeah, it's not going to be good at all. So, and we've seen a lot of this rose rosette disease here lately, Miss Susie. I don't know if you've seen any around Lictor or anything like that, but I've seen it's been it. a problem this year. Okay. Here's our next question. It says, when is it time to plant tulip bugs, Miss Susie? Would you know that? Well, that I do know. Um, and um, I'm a late bulb planter. <laughs> okay. I know daffodils need to go in a little bit earlier to establish some roots to make it through the winter. Okay. But um, I also uh, know that you can plant um, tulips right up through New Year's. I've planted oh, them on New, New Year's year. before. I procrastinated and I rushed out and got them in the ground on a, one of those rare warm days in the winter. They did fine. They, I consider them an annual. I plant them every year if okay. I want them rather than thinking they're okay. going to come back. Wow. So up to New Year's. How about that? I, I was lazy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Miss Susie. Well, that's all we have time for today. Be sure to join us next week. Don't forget, Send us an email, a letter, and let us help answer your gardening questions. And if you miss an episode of The Family Plot, you can watch past shows online. 
just go to WKNO.org and click on KNO Tonight. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Cooper, and I'll see you next time on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.